Good morning and welcome from New Canaan Library. I'm Anthony Maricola, Manager of Adult Services and Programming, and I hope you're all doing well. We have a great program for you this morning. Uh, today we have author Margaret Wills, um, and we're very thankful to have her with us. Um, Margaret Wills is a former publisher at the National Trust. She was educated at Oxford University and spent her career in book publishing before taking up writing full-time. Her previous books include Reading Matters, Five Centuries of Discovering Books, published by Yale, um, Making of the English Gardener, and the, Garden, the Gardens of the British Working Class, as well as Pick of the Bunch, Story of Twelve Treasured Flowers, which was, uh, those were published by Bodleian um, in 2009. She also cultivates her own garden in East London. Um, today, she will discuss her book, The Domestic Herbal, Plants for the Home in the 17th Century, published by Chicago University Press in 2020. Margaret, thank you so much for joining us this morning, or rather your afternoon um, from London. Thank you. Um, today, I'd like to look at some of the plants that were used in the home in the, in the 17th century. Cooking and medicine are obvious areas where plants might be used, but when I investigated further, I found all kinds of fascinating and ingenious uses of plants in a domestic context. Our principal source of information of knowledge comes from herbals. Many years ago, when I was working in publishing, I thought an American editor was teasing me for my cockney roots when he referred to a book of herbs. So you must excuse me applying the H. I suspect that in the 17th century, many people in England would have also talked of herbs, especially in the West Country. Although the term herbal suggests a book about herbs, um, uh, uh, in fact, the, the, these volumes contained the names and descriptions of plants in general, so that flowers, fruit and vegetables are also included with their properties and virtues. In the 15th century, with the invention of movable type by Gutenberg in Mainz, printed herbals were among the first books to be available to a general market, as opposed to manuscripts that could only be consulted by an individual or a restricted community. Such treatises were necessary not only to the herbalist or botanist, but also to the physician, the surgeon, and the apothecary, for whom knowledge of medicinal plants was vital. Probably the first herbal to arrive in North America was that of Rombert Dodoens, carried across uh, 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 on the Mayflower in 1620. Dodoens was Flemish, and so no doubt that Herbal belonged to one of the Dutch contingent on the ship. A translation of Dodoens was undertaken by the London barber surgeon, John Gerard, and published uh, in 1597 by John Norton. The project had been a, a, a challenging one. The woodcuts illustrating the various herbs had to be borrowed from a Frank Frankfurt bookseller with additions for plant new plants that had been introduced into England. One example of a new introduction was what dis was described as the Virginian potato. In fact, it came originally from Peru, perhaps brought to England by Spanish sailors in the middle of the 16th century. John Gerard was the first English writer to illustrate potatoes in his herbal. And this botanical scoop is celebrated in this portrait at the beginning of the book, he's holding a potato flower. So pleased and no doubt relieved at the completion of his publishing project, the bookseller John Norton commissioned a team of women and children to hand color a copy to be presented to Sir Thomas Bodley for his new library in Oxford. As there were nearly 2000 images, completing the project in three years was remarkable for he had to obtain living examples for the reference of the colorists. Many of the images that will illustrate this talk come from that unique book in the Bodleian Library. Gerard's Herbal, also known as the general history of plants, was regarded as valuable because of its illustrations and its comprehensive coverage. Here we have the elaborate title page. Not only did it contain information about the medicinal properties of plants, but it also provided, Gerard also provided gardening and some culinary information. Costing one pound 10 shillings unbound, it was very expensive, 
and like a family Bible, was passed down from one generation to the next. When the eminent horticulturalist Sir Thomas Hanmer had a portrait painted of his second wife, Susan, they decided that she should be depicted consulting a copy of the herbal. Copies also traveled to the colonies of Virginia and New England in the 17th century. Although some of these would have been from the original uh, printing of 1597, the herbal was amend amended and updated by a London apothecary, Thomas Johnson, and republished in 1633. Seven years later, John Parkinson, who described himself as the King's, King, King Charles I herborist, in turn produced his herbal, which he called the Theatrum Britannicum, or the Theatre of Plants. Its elaborate title page shows not only the author, but also the four known continents with animals and plants appropriate to them. Another important source of information about the use of plants in the domestic arena was household manuals. If the lady of the house was literate, she would note down a wide range of recipes from cookery through to medicine, cosmetics, brewing, dyeing, and looking after the house. One of the earliest to survive is that of Lady Eleanor Thetiplace of Appleton Manor in Berkshire, who kept her manual from the 1590s she also included information about planting in the garden. Just as Gerard's herbal was handed through the family, so these household manuals would be inherited by daughters and granddaughters who added their own recipes and household hints. Some made their way across the Atlantic, such as the book now known as Martha Washington's Book of Cookery. The manuscript is in the collection of the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. It was compiled by an unknown hand in the 17th century, taken to Virginia and acquired by Martha in 1749, the year of her marriage to Daniel Custis. She added recipes and handed the book down to her granddaughter. This represents very much the pattern for such manuals. I've been through all the records of the current locations of manuscripts and found none that was started in, the North, in North American colonies um, so I would be very interested if anyone can tell me of one dating from the 17th century. Because they were begun in England, they record plants that were to be found in British gardens. A household manual kept by an anonymous lady in Virginia around the year 1700 contains many recipes identical to those of English housewives. One is for Lady Allen's water for stomach smallpox or surfeit which I found in two other English manuals. It is especially interesting in that it lists a long, it lists a, a long um, a, a series of herbs as in, in ingredients. Many could not have been available to the Virginian lady, yet she felt it was important to list them all. Of course, the same reservation can be applied to any cook who has to adapt recipes to what is on hand. We know that the early colonists took plants and seeds with them as they set off to America. One really informative record is the bill issued to John Winthrop Jr. as he prepared for his journey in the summer of 1631. His supplier was Robert Hill, a grocer at the sign of the Three Angels in Lombard Street in the city of London. The order included seeds for vegetables such as cabbages and carrots for herbs such as hyssop and summer and winter savoury, and flowers such as marigolds and stock gillyflowers. Once in Massachusetts, Winthrop was supplied with plants and trees by his uncle, John Downing, who told him in a letter that he was sending him quadlin, quadlin plants, apples. These would be kept alive by being housed in oyster barrels, although the ship's captain was instructed to take them onto deck on the voyage to give them fresh air. John Jocelyn in 1674 published an account of two voyages to New England in which he looked back to journeys he made in 1638 and 1663. He wrote of American plants, for their variety, number, beauty, style and virtues may stand in competition 
with the plants of any country in Europe. Johnson have added to Gerard's Herbal 300, and Parkinson mentions many more. Had they been in New England, they might have found 1,000 at least, never heard of, nor seen by any Englishman before. Jocelyn gives details of the plants from Europe that thrived and those that did not do so well. Rue, one of the most important herbs used in European medicine, he reports hardly grew in America. But what is remarkable is the number that were successfully introduced. So in this talk, I will concentrate on a selection that demonstrates the range of uses that a housewife was able to put them to. I start with the, with the damask rose. Water distilled from the petals of roses was considered essential for so many 17th century recipes. Gerard regarded the damask rose as the best, explaining, the especial difference consists in the color and smell of the flowers for these are of a pale red colour, of more pleasant smell and fitter for meat and medicine. Rose water was a luxurious ingredient in cookery and medicinal recipes, but also the concentrated oil derived during the distilling process could be used in perfume and in lotions and creams. Distilling took place in a still room in larger households or in the kitchen for more modest house establishments, a sunny windowsill might be brought into play. Charcoal stoves were installed under the window to ensure proper ventilation. The still room was the realm of the lady of the house, assisted by maids or by members of the family. The title page of The Queen Like Closet by Hannah Woolley, first published in London in 1672, shows different domestic tasks. While cookmaids undertake boiling and roasting and baking in ovens, the lady of the house, wearing rather grander clothes, is working in her still room in the picture halfway down on the left, sealing a jar and surrounded by alembic flasks. The importance attached to the seventh in the 17th century to the cultivation of damask roses is highlighted by John Downing writing to his nephew Winthrop to establish whether he has such flowers in New England. If not, he offered to send him red and white damask roses along with the highly perfumed roses from Provence, uh, saying all these three or four pence or more if needs be. While roses formed one of the principal ingredients for work in the still room, rosemary was one of the most important culinary herb herbs for the kitchen. It is one of several plants associated with the Virgin Mary, who was said to have hung her blue cloak over a rosemary bush, thus turning the white flowers into blue. Along with parsley, sage and thyme, it is celebrated in the traditional ballad Scarborough Fair. Recipes for cooking meat frequently mention the use of sweet herbs, sometimes gathered in a faggot. Such a collection would probably have included rosemary along with parsley and thyme. Rosemary was also often used in apple dishes for the dessert course. Our 17th century ancestors had a taste for desserts using the orchard and the dairy in snows syllabubs and cream. Egg, egg whites were used in snows as a raising agent, beaten with thick cream, sugar and rose water until the mixture could stand up in peaks. Recipes sometimes specify the kind of apples to be used, codlings, the type mentioned by John Downing. Uh, as they were young and unripe, they were appreciated for their sharp taste. Sprigs of rosemary would be laid on a plate and the apple snow mixture added. Before toothbrushes with animal bristles made their way from the Orient to Europe, sprigs of rosemary could be used to keep the mouth clean and fresh. Rafe Jocelyn, a clergyman from the English county of Essex, kept a diary for much of the 17th century, providing a valuable source of information about the domestic use of plants. In an effort to relieve toothache, he used a sprig of rosemary so vigorously that he made his mouth sore. 
And then another diarist of the time was, of course, Samuel Pepys. He recorded how when he was suffering from mouth ulcers, his mother sent out her maid to the market to buy herbs so that she could make up a wash to relieve them. He does not specify which herbs were purchased, but contemporary recipes mention rosemary mixed with vinegar and honey. Pepys's great friend was yet another diarist, John Evelyn, and the owner, who was the owner of a famous garden in Deptford, downriver from the city of London. There he grew a large number of rosemary bushes, which were badly damaged in the particularly cold winter of 1683 to 4, when the Thames froze and fairs were held on the ice. In a report to the Royal Society, Evelyn wrote, among our shrubs, rosemary is entirely lost, and to my great sorrow, because I had not only beautiful hedges of it, but sufficient to afford me flowers for making a considerable quantity in hungry water. Claiming he only washed his hair once a year, Evelyn kept it fresh by combing it through with the water said to have been created by a Hungarian queen with distilled rosemary flowers, a predecessor of eau de cologne. Among the list of pot herbs for the kitchen, marig kitchen marigolds often get a mention. This is Calendula officinalis, probably a native of, of Southern Europe. Gerard described it as something sweet with a certain strong smell of a light saffron color or like pure gold. Like rosemary, it is one of the flowers that was associated with the Virgin Mary. And alter alternative names were maybuds and calends, highlighting the fact that it, is, that it flowered for many months. Marigold petals were used in broths and soups, and Gerard thought that they could comfort and strengthen the heart, taken in a cons conserve with sugar. Fresh or dried, they were used as a cheaper substitute for the very expensive spice of saffron for cooking. For the months that the marigold was not in bloom, grocers and spice sellers would dry the petals and keep them in barrels. Hyssop, with its attractive blue flowers, provided a, a series of medicinal uses. Gerard mixed the herb with figs, honey and rue to make a gargle for a persistent cough while a domestic recipe recommended boiling hyssop water with licorice and then setting the syrup in the sun for three weeks before being made into lozenges. And in combination with the herb wormwood, it formed the basis for a conserve that could be used as an antidote to seasickness. Little wonder then that it is one of the list of supplies that John Jocelyn recommended to be taken on the transatlantic voyages undertaken by early settlers in the, new, in the New World. The herb garden not only provided medicines and ointments for the housewife, but also plasters and poultices. The Tudor physician, William Bullain, published a bulwark of defense against all sicknesses, sores and wounds in 1562. As images were very expensive to reproduce, he grouped the most important ones on a couple of pages. And here you can see that you've got the rows um, uh, for, for sweet waters, and then two opening roots, parsley and pennyroyal, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, then plant. There is also plantain and house leek. An Anglo-Saxon verse, possibly dating from the eighth century, celebrated the elastic resident resilience of the plantain, which was known as whey bread, 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 probably because it was found by pathways and roads. The verse also emphasized how plantain put up with being trampled. And it, it is interesting that it was known as the white man's foot in North America. John Gerard explained how plantains could be used in the treatment of ulcers, burns and other wounds and it has been discovered that the tannins and astringent chemicals contained in their leaves act as styptics, healing agents if applied to cuts. 
Plantains were also one of the plants that played a part in St John's Eve celebrations in midsummer. This was probably of pagan origin, adopted by the church and celebrated on the night before the saint's feast day, 24th of June, at the part of the year diametrically opposed to Christmas. The Tudor chronicler of London, John Stowe, described torchlight processions through the streets and the lighting of bonfires. I wonder whether the inclusion of plantains was, was so that they could double up as a convenient bandage for anybody who strayed too near the, too near the bonfires. The house leek or Semper vivum tectorum is a native of mountainous regions of Northern Europe. And tectorum is thought to have der derived from the Norse god Thor. Tradi traditionally, it is grown on roofs as a magic pr magical protection from Thor's thunderbolts when thatch could only too easily catch a, a, a light. The sap from the thick succulent leaves was made into a cooling ointment to treat scalds, burns and ulcers. An alternative name for it in New England was hen and chickens that must have come over with the pilgrims from Dorset and the west of England. Another plant to treat scalds, burns and ulcers was the Hypericum perforatum, St John's word. Gerard recommended putting the leaves, the golden yellow flowers and seeds into olive oil and setting it in the hot sun. Since medieval times, the oil gradually turned red was associated with the beheading of St John the Baptist. Per perforatum comes from the translucent dots that speckle the leaves and resemble tiny holes when those leaves are held up to the light. The plant was therefore considered sympathetic for the treatment of wounds and treat treatments of skin complaints. St John's wort was another of the key plants in the traditional festivities held on the 24th of June. John Stowe described how every door was garlanded with branches and flowers. Brewing was a skill expected of the 17th century housewife. In larger establishments, the brew house would be separate from the house, but for more modest households, the kitchen would once again double up. Ale was the general term given to the fermented drink that resulted from malted grain and water. This could deter deteriorate fairly rapidly, developing a sour taste so that aromatic herbs known as gruting were often added to give flavor. The origin of the term gruit is rather mysterious, but it would seem to have come from an area that is now part of the Netherlands, Belgium and westernmo westernmost uh, Germany, where the sale of gruit was a monopoly and thus a tax on beer. Housewives could set aside a patch in the garden to grow their gruiting herbs. Sometimes their names give a clue. One of these is alehoof, also known as ground ivy. Gerard recommended its use not only in the brewing of ale, but also, quote, against the humming noise and ringing sounds of the ears the condition that we know as tintinous, sorry. He also advised mixing alehoof with daisies and celandine to ease itching and inflammation in the eye. Another herb with ale in, in its name was ale cost. The cost part refers to costus, a spicy plant from Kashmir related to ginger and introduced to England from Central Asia in the 16th century. It is an attractive perennial of the daisy family with beautiful pale silver leaves. An alternative name is Cost Mary, indicating it's another plant associated with the Virgin Mary. The herb was not only used in the brewing of ale, but also in medicine. It's a stringent quality, making it good for problems with the stomach and for blocked noses. It was also known as Bible leaf, as the leaves were used to scent the pages of Bibles and other books to disperse the smell of mildew, a common problem in damp houses. Although it was recommended that brewing should take place in March, alewives brewed regularly. 
The strength of their ale depended on how long it was left in the tun. Small beer, the weakest, was drunk almost at once for everyday consumption, including for children. Strong beers could be brewed for special occasions and kept in store. <clears throat> One such was Braggot or, or, or Braggot. The middle Sunday of Lent was celebrated as Braggot Sunday, so this was presumably when the ale was drunk. One 17th century recipe includes, included licorice as well as honey and curry seeds, giving it a strong taste. No doubt also making it uh, rather uh, 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 contrast to the, uh, the bland fast that uh, Lent involved. Licorice comes from the root of a small perennial native to Southern Europe and to the Middle East, but it is easily cultivated in England and was taken over to North America. John Jocelyn recorded brewing a beer for ailing Indians that included licorice, along with many other strongly flavored herbs. Plants played a major role in keeping 17th century houses sweet and fresh. In The Taming of the Shrew, Shakespeare has one of the servants checking as preparation was made for the return of the master. Where's the cook? Is supper ready? The house trimmed, rushes strewed, cobwebs swept. Sedge and rushes with strewn or, were strewn or scattered upon floors, and if available, fragrant herbs were added to release their scents when walk, walked upon. The Appalachian sweet was particularly applied to these herbs. One such was Cal Calamus aromaticus, known as the sweet flag or sweet rush. It was introduced to English gardens from Turkey in the mid 16th century, and by the 17th it had traveled to America. For John Jocelyn described in his book how it was kept, it was used to keep the feet warm as well as scenting rooms. He advised that the cods best used in May when their fragrance was strongest would last a long time if wrapped up in cotton wool and laid amongst clothes. Gerard describes sweet flag as an aromatical reed of a dark dun color, full of joints and knees, easy to be broken into small splinters, hollow and full of a certain white pith, cobweb wise. I don't have an image from Gerard, but this picture is from a later herbal and shows well the knees and joints. Sweet flag was also used to scent wall hangings, giving off a fragrance reminiscent of orange peel. John Evelyn in his diary mentioned how a friend grew the plants on the banks of her water garden and then hung the rushes in her closet, a private room leading off from her bedchamber. Such hangings might be kept clean by being washed with a herb known as soapwort, sometimes as bouncing bed. It is a relation of the pink and the sweet William, as can be seen from its pretty little flowers. The crushed leaves boiled in water will produce a lava, so have been used for centuries for washing delicate textiles. When valuable old tapestries were damaged by fire at the Sussex Country House of Upart in 1989, the National Trust turned to soapwort to give them a gentle bath. With its fragrance, soapwort could, al could also be used as a strewing herb, and Jocelyn advised that the roots were efficacious when applied to the rash caused by poison ivy. To deal with troublesome insects such as fleas and moths, wormwood would be cultivated by the housewife in her herb garden. Bunches of wormwood were placed in clothes presses as well as being strewn on the floor. A calendar of the year was celebrated in verse by the 16th century commentator on husbandry and gardening, Thomas Tusser. While wormwood has seed, get a bundle or twain, to save against March, to make flee to refrain. Where chamber is sweet and wormwood is strewn, no flea for his life dare abide to be known. What savour is best, if physic, if physic be true, for places infected than wormwood or rue? As ever, wormwood was also a medicinal herb, 
recommended by John Gerard for calming the stomach of those troubled with cholera and as an antidote against the consumption of harmful mushrooms and toadstools if drunk in vinegar. Its name indicates another medicinal purpose to cure worms and it has long been used in the preparation of various aperitifs and, and wines such as vermouth. So bitter is the taste that in the 16th century a distillation would be rubbed on the nipples of a nursing mother to wean the child from the breast and um, Shakespeare mentions this in his play Romeo and Juliet. Also used in clothes presses and to scent rooms were sweet powders. The recipes for which were often, fit, often featured in, in household manuals. Lady Eleanor Fetiplace, for example, gathered for her, her, her herbs and flowers from her garden at Appleton Manor and dried and powdered them before distilling them with spices and grains, uh, gums, sorry, gums. Rose petals collected in early summer were stored in lead line, lined earthen pots, sealed with corks and then dried with sweet marjoram. The mixture containing expensive ingredients acquired from an apothecary or a grocer had to be long lasting. So it was kept in bags tightly sealed to retain the scent. We now think of potpourris um, as being in open bowls uh, in a room uh, but that wouldn't have been the case in the 17th and early 18th centuries. It would, it, the gums and the, and the uh, oils were far too press, precious. So uh, that is something that has changed with time. Sweet marjoram is a native of the Mediterranean, but easily gr grown further north as a half hardy uh, annual, as long as it is protected over winter. Its strong perfume makes it a good candidate, not only for bags, but also for nosegays, literally ornaments for the nose. Marjoram along with lavender has anesthetic properties. So in the 17th century, London civic dignitaries such as judges and aldermen would carry nosegays to mask the smells of unwashed crowds and the threat of the plague. When a new Lord Mayor of London is elected today, he carries just such a nosegay. The selection of plants that I brought into this talk is just a tiny fraction of those that might be used by the housewife. Their ingenuity and hard work in cultivating these in their gardens and using them in different parts of the house can only be wondered at. And thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. That was wonderful. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your research process? Um, gosh, yes. Well, uh, obviously, I've been. I've, I've tried to. I've tried to you to uh, go and look at as many um, manuscript herbals as I can, and and indeed the printed herbals. And we have a lot. In, we're very. We're very blessed in this country, um, in that. Uh, um, uh, the, the libraries, uh, the Wellcome Institute, for instance, has dozens and dozens of these manuals, which they've digitized as well. So um, what I tried to do was to uh, link up different, uh, uh, the different herb, uh, the different uses with these different herbals at different times. And it was fascinating to find that they, um, they were, the, the people were remarkably well, um, stocked for, with herbals uh, and and also with with supplies so one of the herbals that i used was one that the national trust has uh, of a house in the lake district in the north of england in cumbria um, and which is very, still quite an isolated part of the country comparatively speaking but this lady at the uh, at the end of the of the uh, um, 17th century she had this uh, herbal with which, which she uh, kept uh, but all, and, and obviously got, um, got supplied with the spices and the dye, the expensive dye ingredients that she needed for, for uh, home dyeing. Um, uh, and then she had the recipes, uh, which she said had been supplied to her by a Scotch woman. Um, so so the, the, these were incredibly uh, uh, useful to me. Uh, um, and, and obviously the, the, the printed herbals as well. 
so I tried to 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 uh, to uh, to go to the diff different kinds of houses they had. Um, so that uh, Elizabeth uh, uh, in the Lake District, Elizabeth Burkett, she she uh, obviously lived in a farmhouse, whereas Lady Eleanor Fessy Place lived in a, um, a manor house. And then I found a, 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 the uh, manual of a lady in London called Mary Doggett, who was um, the wife of a theatre manager. He, his name, he's famous because there's an annual um, race on the Thames, Thames Waterman for the to a Doggett cap, cap and belt badge, still still going, I think even during COVID, or maybe not. Um, but, and she, and again, very sophisticated recipes, and she obviously, and she obviously used the apothecaries in London, so that, uh, you know, that th these were very useful. But I also found a, a very useful source of information was the recreations of gardens uh, in host historic houses, um, so that uh, um, we have so, uh, we have this house, uh, this this museum called the Weald and Downland Museum, which is in Sussex near Chichester, where they rescued a lot of the houses uh, that were being threatened with demolition for various reasons. And I think that this is something that happens a lot in America, it has happened a lot in America, hasn't it as well? So they, so these houses were, were, were transported um, to, to this site um, uh, and then appropriate gardens grown around, uh, created around them. And these were incredibly useful to me. And they, 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 they're extraordinary. They managed to recreate gardens from the middle ages right down to, to the Edwardian period, the beginning of the, uh, 20th century so um, that, that those were really useful and the gruiting herbs for instance I got they got the information for those for, from them they'd grown them as, as, as a patch you know for the for the um, the alewife to brew oh, wonderful um, somebody um, Mary asked how effective were these were these remedies um, and are they used in homeopathy today Yes, well, indeed, uh, uh, some of them rather fascinatingly, yes, uh, were. Uh, well, I don't know how one never knows with with the, how how good they were at the time. Of the, um, Pepys got rid of his mouth ulcers, I guess. Um, but uh, uh, the one of the really interesting ones is was is salix, um, which is willow, and, and salix is is, uh, is an ingredient of aspirin. And um, Gerard describes how uh, uh, people would take, drag uh, branches of willow in, into uh, the bedrooms of people who are suffering from ague, um, uh, uh, because it, it somehow they, it, it seemed to give relief to 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 uh, to them to be able to to have this in the room. So extraordinary that say, you know this was that they re they recognised this and used it. Um, you had. You has some book, book, books, which is Buxus, um, apparently has uh, uh, ingredients which are now regarded as being useful in the treatment of um, cancer. Um, and uh, so, it, it, and then the, 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 what we have in this country, the, the, uh, very much the, uh, the uh, custom of um, applying when people are stung by nettles, of applying uh, 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 some common is called that. Sorry, dock, dock, dock leaves. <laughs> sorry, uh, and, and it has been discovered that the, these release some kind of um, of, uh, uh, of, of uh, 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 essence which which relieves them. And uh, as I mentioned earlier about the um, um, the styptics in in, in plantain, which people regard as such a sort of weed, you know, sort of you know, trample that underfoot, but <clears throat> actually it was very useful. Now, I um, there's another question here, um, and I see that um, there's a lot of comments about the the, the lovely illustrations. I, I mean, a, oh, lot of those a lot of those illustrations are almost artwork in themselves. Um, yes. are, there a, are there a lot of illustrated guides um, from that time? No, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> there are there are um, there are other uh, there are other herbals, but um, and uh, but they 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 tend to be very um, 
well they tend to be, they're always in black and white so this is completely unique because it's hand colored and a lot of these pictures I have reproduced in the in the in the domestic herbal so people can can get hold of it through that they can see them in the book um, and, and you will notice sometimes that they, they, the shape of them is quite is quite um, uh, and you, so this one here, you can see how it's fitted into. It's very much the, the, the boxwood uh, wood block from the Frankfurt um, uh, pub, uh, printer, pub, publisher, bookseller. Uh, it, it's you can see how it's shaped. So it's very, it's very quite square. Um, the same with uh, the uh, St John's Wort, and then, I mean, the, mo most books are much more like uh, the period. Were much more like this. The uh, the um, uh, uh, Boulain's uh, one about surgery that that would have been much more the the, the normal uh, normal um, uh, 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 book um, and fairly vague although actually quite not bad I mean the plantain you can see quite quite clearly although I don't think the rose is very clear um, so there's another one that's I I know that I was when I well, maybe I haven't got it. I, I, I thought I'd got another one, which was very square. Um, so, so this would would have had draw, uh, drawings in it, but they wouldn't be particular. They wouldn't have been coloured. Uh, wouldn't have been coloured. Uh, Parkinson did also produce a lovely gardening book, uh, which is called Parkinson's Sun, uh, because it, it's it's uh, it, a paradisus in in sole. It's a sort of uh, uh, a, a joke on his on his name. And that's got lots and lots of um, uh, illustrations uh, it, it grouped together of, of plants. But, uh, but Gerard really is quite unique. And the other great um, herbal of the 18th, 17th century was uh, Culpeper, Nicholas Culpeper, which is still in print. It's absolutely extraordinary. Uh, but Culpeper was very concerned. He was very yeah, radical. Yeah. He, he was very he, he was very radical he didn't um, he uh, uh, he fought against King Charles and got uh, got um, uh, shot in the chest uh, during the Civil War and he had he smoked to, he, very heavily so he didn't actually survive all that much longer <laughs> but uh, um, he but he he was very keen that that, that uh, he should provide um, uh, Herbal, a herbal that was available for ordinary people to read because the College of Physicians was trying to make it a, a sort of like a, almost like a uh, um, something that only they could it could be in Latin and only they could uh, could could study it. So he 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 had a great fight with the uh, College of Pharma, uh, for, with the uh, with the Royal College of Physicians. So he produced a. Um, a, a herbal that was, uh, and he said it's, it's stipulated it should be only three, three or four pence, and it was particularly aimed at women because women were not as literate as men and certainly didn't have as much education in, in Latin, for instance. So, so that has no pictures at all in it, but he he felt it was so important that they should have the information. Oh, wonderful. Somebody had just uh, posted a comment here, um, and this is along the lines of the, the comment that when you were talking about um, nettle stings, somebody had said jewel weed will relieve nettle stings along with plantain and dock. Just macerate leaf and rub on nettle sting. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> um, Margaret, it was such a pleasure to have you today. Thank you so much um, for this brilliant presentation. Um, it, it was really lovely and it was uh, wonderful to spend our um, early afternoon with you. So thank you very much. Thank you. I very much enjoyed it too. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Um, New Canaan community, thank you for attending. Um, and I wish you a wonderful rest of day as well.